The World with Richard Engel and Yalda Hakim is a brand new podcast from Sky News. With me, Sky News' lead world news presenter, Yalda Hakim. And me, Richard Engel, Chief Foreign Correspondent for NBC News. Every week, we'll be reporting from the front line of the world's trouble spots and asking the big questions to the world's most important and influential people. Join us for the ground truth to help you understand what is happening in the world today and why it matters to you. So that's The World with Richard Engel and Yalda Hakim. Listen every Wednesday, wherever you get your podcast. Welcome back to the Sky News Daily. Neil Patterson here in the studio. And we're going to be looking at, well, one of the most concerning weekends that we have seen so far in the current Middle East crisis. Back on Friday, we saw the death of Hassan Nasrallah, that, of course, the leader of the Iranian-backed, Lebanon-based Hezbollah militia. Further strikes took place over the weekend, targeting the leadership of Hamas in Lebanon and also the popular front for the liberation of Palestine. (sighs) Combined with those ongoing operations in Gaza, Israel is currently fighting on a number of fronts and it certainly feels, it feels like it might be moving towards all-out war with Hezbollah. Of course, all the while, we do keep hearing of the concerted efforts by the United States, the United Nations and others to bring some much needed peace to the region. So is there anything, anything that the international community can do to bring an end to the bloodshed? Well, joining us once again on The Daily to try and answer that question, we have Professor Michael Clark, Sky's military analyst, and Dominic Waghorn, our international affairs editor. Good to see the both of you. Michael, to, to you first... With the killing of Nasrallah and, of course, the ground strikes that we are seeing, the the air strikes that we continue to see, it does feel that we are edging closer to what I I suppose you would call all-out war between Hezbollah and Israel. I mean, if that happens, what does it look like? Well, it looks like a continuation of what we've seen in the last couple of weeks because, I mean, we're just a year away from the October the 7th atrocity that started this latest um, crisis. And in that year, the, the Israelis have essentially absorbed the, the hurt of it. They've come out fighting, and now they look as if they're ready to take on all of their uh, opponents. Uh, they, they interpreted the 7th of October always as an attempt to create the big war, to destroy Israel totally. This is the biggest crisis since 1948. They said that at the time. And it looks as if a year later, they feel as if the wheel has now turned and that they're now in a position to take on all of their opposition, if necessarily simultaneously. That's the mood they're in, I think, at the moment. So, you know, what it would look like would be Israel fighting everybody simultaneously, with the possible exception of Iran. And that's the big question mark. You know, will the Iranians respond? If they did, how would the, the, the Israelis take them on? Dominic, it's the timing of it. That really has struck me. I mean, you're you're speaking to us from Washington. You were previously in New York for the UN General Assembly. I mean, there was a litany of people at the UN saying, you can't do this. You've got to stop now, including Sir Keir Starmer, of course. Not a bit of that appears to have registered with the Israeli Prime Minister. There was one leader or one diplomat after another from countries in the region and in the West all calling for the same thing, a diplomatic solution, uh, an easing of tensions and really worried about civilians, calling for the protection of of civilians. And then overnight, uh, we got the impression from American officials that uh, the kind of diplomatic initiative they'd been involved in with the Israelis and G7 partners had borne fruit. But by the next day, the Israelis were saying very different things, I think partly because there was a, a, a political backlash amongst uh, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu's far-right partners and publicly as well, saying this was not the moment to engage in a 21-day ceasefire. They felt they had his baller where they wanted them and they should press home the advantage. But I think also they obviously saw an opportunity uh, to take out Nasrallah and, and they took it. Um, but there's a sense, I think, of powerlessness and a, a sense of uh, real desperation that the diplomacy failed and events are moving in a very different direction. I'm sure that Netanyahu will have given authority to his uh, forces to go after Nasrallah if they found him, wherever they found him. It happened that they found him when when the prime minister was in New York and they weren't going to let that opportunity go because uh, Hezbollah knew with all of their communications down, they had to communicate in person and going to a meeting in person was a dangerous thing to do. So they wouldn't have made the meeting last any longer than it needed to. So once Israeli intelligence could place Nasrallah where they did place him in uh, Herat Arik, 
um, in uh, in Beirut, in southern Beirut, they had a very limited time to go for him. And I think that they probably said to the prime minister, we've got him. What do you want to do? And the prime minister said, do it, do it. And the fact that he was in New York at the time at the General Assembly, in a sense, was incidental because they couldn't let the intelligence opportunity slip. That's what I think. Publicly, the Americans can't show any distance or space between them and the Israelis because that could encourage Iran and Israel's enemies uh, to try and drive a wedge between the two. So publicly, the, the Americans have to show staunch support. But we know from behind the scenes they're frustrated. Relations are strained. But I don't think America can do anything about this. I think there's a sense here in Washington that there's a momentum that they can't really uh, even slow down, let alone reverse. But as much as anything else, Michael, isn't this just deeply embarrassing for the United States? Having, as, as, as Dominic and yourself have already mentioned, fl- touted the fact that there was not a peace deal uh, on the table, but definitely efforts towards a ceasefire. Is it just the case that the United States doesn't have leverage over Israel anymore? Uh, very little of it. And I think this has been a very sobering year for American diplomacy, regardless of who's in the White House that what it has shown since last October, that the Americans you know, can offer advice, but the Israelis are not in a mood, to, or Netanyahu certainly is not in a mood to take it when they feel as if they're being so egregiously attacked. And yet the Americans are still legally obliged, legally obliged in their law to send uh, $3.6 billion worth of military aid every year to uh, Israel. And Obama, when he was at, a, at his wit's end with Netanyahu years ago, tried to convert that to civilian aid in order to express his displeasure. And he couldn't do it. He just couldn't do it. He had to back off. It doesn't matter what the Americans say. Netanyahu, in his present mood and with the government around him, is essentially not listening. Doesn't it again show the United Nations for what it is right now? Nothing more than a talking shop. When you have two members of the Security Council, China and Russia, able to veto, able to stymie any action when it comes to the Middle East. I mean, what's the point? Yeah, well, Russia uses its veto in the Middle East, but also over Ukraine as well. But America's effectively obstructing any progress towards um, a, a diplomatic solution because it's not getting involved. You know, there are mechanisms at the UN that can be used. There are resolutions that can be used if the Security Council has unanimity. Uh, and and is united on on that sort of uh, on that resolve, uh, and that's what Middle Eastern diplomats were saying to me outside these meetings. They were saying that the, the, the stuff we can do here, there are diplomatic means by which we can restrain Israel. It's just America's not letting us uh, use them. The UN Security Council is effectively hamstrung. Russia doesn't want to get involved with this. It's been critical of Israel, but it's not getting involved. China's, as usual, kind of sitting on the sidelines and doesn't feel it needs to get involved it can be critical but it's not getting involved directly so we had one meeting then we had talk of a ceasefire then we had a massive escalation and by the next day or two days later there was another UN Security Council meeting and the diplomats I was talking to were saying this is pointless that that, what is the point of having another meeting when the first one failed to produce a ceasefire and things are going in the direction they are. So is this the point then Michael that we start looking to, to the regional partners, the regional players, to try and uh, exert some leverage. Again, I'm wondering whether there's anyone there that has the, the, the inclination, the gumption, or even the strength to, to do anything about it, to, to, to persuade Hezbollah to step back. I mean, somebody, a, a, an ex-British minister said to me a, a couple of weeks ago, he said, you know, the British media, with the best will in the world, he said the British media don't really get how hated Israel is within the region and the wider world he said we don't we don't kind of pick up on that in the way we the way our media reports it and so there is a sense in which the saudi arabias and the united arab emirates and the qatars and the kuwaits and the and the uh, omans they've got to be careful um, in the way that they take forward any attempt to sort of reach out to this netanyahu government which has made itself so hated across the region so at the moment there's nothing going on very much at the regional level that matters. A lot of people are talking, a lot of, a lot of diplomats are going backwards and forwards, a lot of track to dip, diplomats in a sense that people are in the institutes and the NGOs. They're talking to each other all the time. They're having endless meetings about how do we get out of this? So there's no lack of, of intellectual um, engagement with it. But at the high political level, is there any real um, initiative going forward, coming forward from um, Saudi Arabia? Not that I'm really aware of. 
It's very important also to point out that, you know, while there's a huge amount of mourning of Hassan Nasrallah in, in public in the Middle East, there's also a real sense of quiet satisfaction amongst his enemies and Iran's enemies. I think uh, everyone is horrified by the direction and the speed with, with which things are moving in the Middle East and very concerned about you know, it, it unravelling out of control. I think there will be, obviously, a sense of satisfaction amongst Iran's enemies that Iran has been massively weakened by the events of the last week or so. Michael, Dominic, uh, that seems a good place to pause. When we come back, we will discuss in a bit more depth Benjamin Netanyahu and how domestic politics may well be influencing his international decisions. Welcome back. Our military analyst, Michael Clark, and our international affairs editor, Dominic Wycon, still with us. Dominic, let, let's talk about Benjamin Netanyahu, because the, the last time we talked, we certainly identified that there are domestic concerns which are shaping some of the decisions that Benjamin Netanyahu is making. Killing Nasrallah will have been incredibly popular domestically. It will be seen as an intelligence success, and an intelligence success which, of course, was completely lacking on October the 7th. Netanyahu's ratings have gone from sort of rock bottom to now climbing up again. And that is kind of a feature of of his political career. Uh, When he's in trouble politically, uh, if he then engages on the Iranian question, he starts doing better because his kind of pitch to Israelis has always been that he can help Israel punch above its weight globally, that he can phone up the White House or Downing Street and say, I've got to come over and, and meet you and always gets a meeting. And he's made a whole career out of championing Israel and protecting Israel against the Iranian threat. You know, there are critics who say that it's not about Israel's security or protection. It is, it is all about his political career. And he is trying to ward off the moment when the war in Gaza comes to an end, when Israel finally gets round to a reckoning about what happened on October the 7th and investigates it and he is held to account. I think also it has to be said that he does regard himself as a kind of Israeli Churchill. And this is all about, I think he does seem to believe that total victory against Hamas is possible, whereas most sceptics say it's not. And he wants to defend Israel and and vanquish all its enemies. So I think there there is definitely a part of his character that believes in this. He is someone who's from the special forces, originally in a military sense. That's where his background is. He's always seemed to have been rather suspicious of artillery and infantry and and big wars. He's always tried to avoid them despite his kind of belligerent reputation. And I think you have to wonder what he's planning to do now. Is he going to be happy with a grand invasion? Michael, we have to assume that Benjamin Netanyahu does have one eye on what will be taking place in the United States uh, come November, the US presidential election. I mean, I think it's fair to say that he does view Donald Trump as an ally, doesn't he? Oh, for sure. Because during the last Trump presidency, I mean, Trump moved the American embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. There are only, I think it's five embassies out of 150 odd who've moved to Jerusalem. And the United States is a significant one. And there's a couple of others. I can't remember who they are now, but they're very minor countries. And and that was a big, big step. And then Donald Trump always says when he's asked about, well, what would you do? He always says, well, this wouldn't have happened if I'd been president which is clearly ridiculous. I mean, he, he seems to assume that nothing bad in the world would ever have happened if only he was sitting in the White House, that every everyone would be too frightened to do anything. I mean, if he does win the presidency, the, the uh, inability of America to affect much that goes on in the Middle East will be a real education for him. At this stage in the electoral cycle, even if Joe Biden, who was a staunch ally and supporter of Israel, even if he'd wanted to confront Netanyahu to call him out over Gaza, which might then have kind of restrained the Israelis over Lebanon. There's no way he could have done that to any great degree because politically it would be pretty disastrous for him. Michael, does the United Kingdom have any involvement in what's going on in the Middle East right now? I mean, we we know at the General Assembly there was no meeting between Starmer and Netanyahu. There had been hopes they could meet in the the margins. We know that the UK has suspended some arms sales and has has called for a ceasefire. I mean, beyond that, Are we doing anything? We're quite good at helping to build consensus insofar as that matters within the Western nations. So we stick fairly closely to the United States, but not close on every issue. Um, And so we, we try to create a better Western approach to this whole thing. Um, The country that actually has the European country that has more leverage than us is France, because the French, particularly over Lebanon, they've had a long relationship with Lebanon, just as we have a long relationship with Jordan, going back to uh, the 1930s, in effect, to Transjordan. So the French have always had a good relationship with, with traditionally with Syria and with Lebanon. And the French have better contacts. And so I think that, you know, the, the French have a better role to play independently 
Britain has a role to play within the collective uh, Western group of nations. But, uh, you know, we can play the role as vigorously as we want. We're in a phase of this war where none of it's going to make a lot of difference. There are times in war when both sides just want to fight or feel they have no alternative but to fight. They're going to fight each other until some new reality emerges from the violence. And when they're in that sort of state where they just have to fight or feel they have to fight, there's not much that any of the outside world can do about it. Let me try and just just, just kind of sum up where we are at the moment. We have dwindling United States influence in the region. We've got an atrophied United Nations. We've got a, a lack of interest or, or more than that disinterest um, from regional partners. <laughs> Ultimately, we don't have a coherent and coordinated international response at the moment in the sense that there is no one, there is no institution or nation that can simultaneously put pressure on Hamas, Hezbollah and Israel. And absent that... War's just going to happen. I think we're at a very dangerous moment. I think, you know, the, the, the risk of an all-out war, which was what Michael and I and others have been warning about for a year, is, is coming closer. But an all-out war would be everyone fighting everyone. And it looks like Iran does not want to take things that far. I've regarded Hezbollah and their proxies as an insurance policy, most of all. And that's why they're given so many missiles, which the Israelis are busily destroying airstrike by airstrike. A, a, an insurance policy against the day when Israel decides possibly to attack Iran and try and take out its nuclear uh, facilities. If it now looks at that policy and thinks, well, that hasn't worked, you know, we've, we've been snookered and that policy has been destroyed, what do they do next? Do they, do they see the insurance policy as actually going hell for leather to uh, build the bomb, which I think is likely and extremely dangerous for the region because it then leads to a nuclear uh, arms race. The other big risk now is that Israel overreaches. It's not restrained. Go in on the ground. They get sucked into a ground war in southern Lebanon. I think all of us think that there's no easy way for Israel to conquer Lebanon, even though they could conquer a part of it and then they'd be stuck. But the IDF is on a high at the moment. They think that they are proving that by um, both sheer power and great ingenuity, they can outwit any of their enemies. And so I think that there is a, there is a sense in which they're on a roll. Because what, what I'm not clear about, Neil, is, is how does Israel see its objectives being achieved? Its objectives are to get its citizens back into the northern communities that they've been evacuated from for a year now, 60, 70,000 uh, people. They're not going to go back until they feel safe. I mean, Hezbollah retains a massive missile arsenal, but obviously the way things are going at the moment it is Hezbollah will be in no mood to negotiate, even if it's as it's being dismantled piece by piece by Israel. It will retain an ability and a potential a capability to carry on attacking Israel. Yeah, and the point is they've got tens of thousands of rockets, both short and long range. And if they could could recreate the ability to send thousands of them at, at any one time, they would overwhelm Israeli air defences and they could devastate northern Israel including Tel Aviv and Haifa. And, that, and that's a sort of deterrent. It's almost like a, having a nuclear bomb. They have, they have a potential deterrent that could devastate the northern part of the country. And, and I don't see that there's much the Israelis can do to neutralize that unless they can occupy the whole of Lebanon and do, another, do, a, do a, a, a Gaza on Lebanon, which would be very hard to imagine. Well, I suppose we will find out the next steps in this Middle East conflict very, very soon indeed. Uh, Dominic Wycon. Michael Clark, great to see you both. Thanks for being with us. That is your lot for today. But of course, if you want the up to the minute latest on what is taking place in the Middle East, just head to skynews.com. Uh, the Daily Podcast team and I are off on the train to Birmingham for the Conservative Party conference. That's what we'll be reporting on tomorrow. We'll see you then.